Good evening. Evening. Like six people say good evening. evening. All right. That was, you know, it's the last night of EBS, and you still can't. You're not ready when I get up here. Good evening. evening. Okay, that was all right. Thank you all for coming. It's uh, it's been a great week. That's exactly right. It's been that good. <laughs> just like your daddy. <laughs> so, uh, just to update, I haven't updated you on our numbers. I, I think I did the, like the first two nights and I didn't say anything else about it, but first night was, if I can remember, 147, then 151, then 152. Last night was 172, I believe. And so tonight... I'm going to guess we're going to be a little below 172 unless we have a, a bus of folks come in. So we're hoping we can maybe break that number or at least hit it. So each night's been great. Uh, it's because we don't have a skit tonight. That's why everybody's not here. If, you, if you've been here for the skits, uh, you might think I'm wrong. I might be uh, glad that we're not having a skit. But no skit tonight. We're going to sing a few songs, Mark and I. Um, and then we'll dismiss the class, and we'll have class period, and then we'll be downstairs again for our, in our marketplace, have the kids have a chance to spend some more money to buy something again tonight. Uh, so we look forward to that. And then we'll also give away our awards to, uh, tonight downstairs as well. So adults, if any of y'all are interested in going downstairs to, for the uh, awards, she's, she's, 
She's got something to say tonight, don't she? Yeah. If you're interested in seeing the uh, awards giveaway, you can come downstairs and see that. Uh, before we get started, we have a, a key that was found, a car key, that was found in the parking lot. So uh, we're giving away a car tonight, so we're going to draw for that. Uh, no, seriously, somebody lost a key. So I would push the panic button to see whose it is, but I'm not going to do that to embarrass anybody. But we're going to, it's going to end up back here in the back. Uh, someone will come grab it, and you can get that. Uh, from that, uh, I guess Brother Mike, he's uh, heading this way now. So I'll hand this to Mike Robertson, and he'll have that in the back. If, if you lost your car key, please get that from him. And we'll uh, begin singing now. Come up the hill and then he walks down again. Now we go up, and when we go up, we're going to have a good 
Okay, uh, we'll go ahead and dismiss our classes now. Crater roll. Y'all may go. Followed by the step up class, followed by our three and four year old class. <clears throat> Pre K and kindergarten, y'all can follow right behind them. See you, buddy. All right, first and second grade. Me? Not me. Yeah. 
You. First and second grade. Third through fifth grade. Sixth through twelfth grade. Right in there. I know I am up against the major clock tonight because y'all have homemade ice cream downstairs. So I promise to make this short and sweet, but we do have quite a bit of material to cover tonight. If you have your Bibles, let me encourage you to go ahead and get them out. What I want us to do is I want us to kind of reestablish where we are. Um, the whole week has been on titled kind of the defenders, I think is the theme that the young people are using. Fearless, being able to defend our own faith. And so I want to bring back to mind the fact that we have got scripture that clearly states the fact that God is the creator. He's the creator of all things. Look in Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 6. You alone are the Lord. You made the heaven. The heaven of heavens with all their hosts, the earth and everything on it, the seas and all that is in them, you preserve them all. The host of heaven worships you. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 1, thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne. My earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you'll build me? Where is the place of my rest? For all those things my hand has made. And all those things exist, says the Lord. But on this one will I look. On him who is poor and of contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. Colossians chapter 1 verse 16, Paul said, For by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. Over and over again, God's word is making it crystal clear. This wasn't an evolutionary process. He didn't need help. You look in Psalm chapter 8, starting in verse 3. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you're mindful of him? The son of man that you visit him. For you made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands, have put all things under his feet. Psalm 100, verse 3, the psalmist says, Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who has made us, and not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. I don't think it is news to anybody in here that Satan is doing a really, really good job of teaching our children basically the opposite of everything we just read. A lot of people who are trying to infect their minds with the idea that we evolved, that we just got here by chance. There really is no God. And so our kids run off to school and they read things like we evolved from some ape-like creature. Now, keep in mind what we just read, verse after verse after verse. God, you created everything. And then also keep in mind when Jesus was asked the question, what is the greatest command? You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul. What's the third one? With all your mind. And then think about what we're putting in the hearts and the minds of our children in some of those textbooks. This one says, you're an animal, you share common heritage with earthworms. If I were to ask you, where did all this come from? A guy by the name of Adolf Hitler once made the comment, he said, 
if you tell a big enough lie and tell it frequently enough, it will be believed. Let's walk back in time to the 1800s when a guy by the name of Charles Darwin was born, February the 12th, 1809. All right, let's see who's really paying attention. Who else was born February 12th, 1809? Who said that? He's right, Abraham Lincoln. Talk about two people who took two totally different routes. You've got one, comes president, he's ruling over the Civil War, you've got another who is starting this theory. Charles Darwin's mom died when he was young, about eight years old. So the primary influence in his life was his father. His father was a physician, his grandfather was a physician. So guess what Charles Darwin was expected to be? He's expected to follow in their footsteps. Tender age of 16, they sent him off to Edinburgh University, and he found out he didn't really care for the sight of blood. Now, you got to remember this is back in the time before anesthesia. This is back before the time of, like, vacuum suction. In fact, part of a medical student's job during that time was to physically hold down patients as they were cutting them open. Not a whole lot of fun. He writes home, he tells his dad, look, I, I don't think this is going to work. And his dad realizes the family name is kind of at stake here. But he realizes there is one occupation that could kind of save the family name, and that is if he were called into the ministry. So he packs him up, sends him off to Cambridge, where Charles Darwin received the only degree that he would ever get in his lifetime, a degree in, of all things, Bible. Now that kind of cracks me up because our culture loves to elevate this guy as like the greatest scientist of all time, and yet the reality is he studied Bible. The year that he was graduating, he got well acquainted with one of his professors, a guy by the name of Sir John Henslow. Henslow was not just a professor, he was also a botanist. So he would take Darwin along with him, kind of on nature treks, they would go find new specimens. And it was Henslow who realized Charles Darwin had a knack for identifying specimens, collecting new ones. So he got him a job was a volunteer job. It was supposed to be two years on a boat, a ship to be exact, the HMS Beagle. That two-year journey ended up lasting five. And when you read Charles Darwin's autobiography, you find out two things. Number one, he was highly prone to seasickness. Spent a whole lot of time in the bottom of that boat throwing up. But you learn he was also a very good naturalist. Every time that boat would pull into a port, he would jump off, collect as many plants, animals, specimens as he could, ship them back to England. They make it around the coast of South America. They come up the coast to Ecuador, and then they head out on the equator. About 500 miles off the coast of Ecuador, they run into a group of islands called the Galapagos Islands. And it was there that Charles Darwin really kind of changed the way he was thinking about things. He recorded in all of his writings about how it was like stepping back in time. He actually described it as the pre-flood world. Several years ago, I decided to kind of follow in his footsteps, had the opportunity to go to the Galapagos, and he's right. There are things that you're going to see there that you will not see anywhere else out in nature. Certain animals, for instance, like these particular birds or some of the salt marine iguanas. But the thing that caught his attention the most were the finches. He found 13 total, collected them, stuffed them, shipped them back to Europe, continued on his journey, 
he gets back to his office, he's going through everything, and he looks at these 14 different finches, and he thinks, surely God did not put 14 finches on the Galapagos Islands. Surely what happened is there was an original pair that got there by boat or, or by a storm, and from that original pair, all of these varieties resulted. And so in his notes, he actually drew this drawing, a, a branch tree that he basically was saying, all right, the bottom of this tree, you've got the original pear. Then maybe you've got over here a, a branch with thick beaks and over here a branch with thin beaks. He liked that idea so much that he eventually applied it to everything. And he said, you know, if there was this common pair of finches, maybe there was a common ancestor for everything. And so lo and behold, we get this evolutionary tree of life. It is now a staple in most of the textbooks. It's an evolutionary icon, something they hold up to our kids to say, look, this is how it happened, even though realistically, there's not any scientific evidence to back up that evolutionary tree of life. He writes a book in 1859. There is the full title, which you won't see in print anymore. Full title was The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or The Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. Why do you think we're not going to see the full title anymore? Anybody think that you really want to see that whole favored races thing? Charles Darwin most definitely believed that white people were further evolved than dark-skinned people. Not something we publish that much or, or brag about in our classrooms anymore. But when you read his writings, here's what he basically thought. Dark-skinned people were closer to the apes, or as he called it, the simium stem of monkeys. And so in his mind, you've got dark-skinned people, and then several hundred thousand years later, white man comes walking out of Europe. So in Darwin's mind, white people, further evolved, superior, smarter, etc. Obviously, it's not something we talk a lot about today. Because if you think about it for just a minute, what it's really doing, it's teaching racism. And isn't it ironic that they're always talking about, we have to teach evolution. In fact, we need to teach it as a fact. And then when you point out um, your little theory there that's wrong, by the way, teaches racism, they don't really catch on to that a whole lot. Darwin, in his book, as I pointed out two nights ago, he realized that there was problems with it. He had a whole chapter devoted to problems with his theory. Biggest problem, he didn't know where those missing links were. And it's interesting that we still don't really know where those missing links are. Now we've got images like the ones you see on the screen. These alleged missing links, Neanderthal man, Lucy, all the different alleged fossil men. But when you stop and you really look at it, you realize that's not exactly a missing link. In fact, we're going to go through several of them, and you're going to understand why I don't call them missing links anymore. Somebody says, okay, what does it matter anyway? I mean, what, Brad, why does it matter if my kid believes God created man directly or maybe he used evolution? Or, or what does it matter if it was six days or six million years? I'm going to let you tell me tonight. Why does it matter? Truth. By the way, is there such thing as absolute truth? Absolutely there is. I argued with one guy one time. He goes, absolutely not. I was like, are you sure about that? He didn't catch on. There is absolute truth. Where does it come from? John 17, 17, 
Sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. We did a little experiment one time with a bunch of young people, youth, in the church. They were at a place called Evangelism University down in uh, Savannah, Tennessee. We went around with a video camera and we interviewed them and we asked them two questions. What is truth and where does it come from? They got the first answer pretty right. They would say things like, um, truth is the opposite of lying. Or, or truth is it being honest. When we asked them where did it come from, what do you think they said? What do you think? Let me give you the top four or five answers. We had people saying, well, it comes from within your heart. Uh, it comes from inside where nobody sees. It, it comes from deep inside you. Several of them said, you know, I really don't know. And folks, what, what's the problem with us saying that truth comes from within inside us? Anybody see a problem with that? <laughs> yeah, because your truth might be a little different than my truth, which is why we need to make sure our kids understand there is absolute truth. And when we compromise this stuff, ultimately what we're doing is we're compromising the creation account, the foundation of the Bible. And if there was no creator, then there's no savior. Go back and look at John 1 again. In the beginning was the Word. Who, who actually created everything? Jesus. Jesus. By the way, all three of them were present. God, Christ, Holy Spirit. All three present at the creation account. You take that away, what did you just do to Jesus Christ? Does it matter? Absolutely. I taught you guys about Revelation, or Genesis chapter 3 kind of being a landmark point where prior to that, covenant relationship with God, after that point, we're trying to get back into that covenant relationship. We see the very first messianic prophecy in Genesis chapter 3 where you remember God is punishing Adam. He punishes Eve. He punishes the serpent. By the way, he also does something else sometimes we miss. He curses the ground. But in punishing that serpent, he says, yeah, you, you may bruise his heel, but ultimately he's going to crush your head, which, by the way, he did at Calvary. If there was no Adam, if there was no Eve, if there was no Genesis 3, then really in the beginning all there was was dirt. So here's what our kids get a picture of right here. A me but a man. If you've got your Bible, open it up to Genesis chapter 2. I'm going to give you three things I want you to remember from Genesis chapter 2. Look with me at verse 15. Then the Lord took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. Point number one. Man was industrious enough to work. In fact, he was expected to work. By the way, had they not sinned, what would Adam still be doing today? Tending and keeping it. Guys, if you're in this room and you think basically all you need to be doing is living off a welfare check, let me tell you something, that's anti-biblical. God has always intended man to work. The curse was that our work would actually be harder. So, industrious enough to work. Look at the very next verse, verse 16. The Lord God commanded a man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. In the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it to you in the way I like to a lot of times teach young people, okay? Because sometimes I don't think they really get the, the big picture. Imagine God coming up to Adam and saying, Adam, you see those 5,000 acres right over there? 
that's all yours. I created that for you. And, and those 7,000 acres of fruit trees behind you, every bit of that, you can have a different fruit every meal right behind you. And all of that to your left, Adam, that's all for you. All of it. But not this one. This one's mine. What do we sometimes do when God says something like this? Instead of looking at all the blessings we got around us, we focus on that but, but not this one. Number two, Adam was smart enough to know right from wrong. So he's industrious enough to work. Smart enough to know right from wrong. Skip down to verse 20. Adam gave name to all the cattle, to the birds of the air, to every beast of the field. You remember, God is parading the animals in front of him. His job is to name the animals. And the implication is he's not to just name it. He's to remember that name and then pass it on to his offspring. Three things. Smart enough to work, knows right from wrong, intelligent enough to name the animal. By the way, why did he parade those animals in front of Adam? Do you remember what happened right before the parade? Back up and look with me at verse 18. Lord God said, it is not good. All through Genesis 1. God did it, it was good. God did it, it was good. God did it, it was good. Now we come to Genesis 2. By the way, sin hasn't been introduced into the camp. But there's something that's not good. So here's my question for you. Why didn't God just immediately make woman right then? You ever ask yourself that? Like... He says, it's not good and man be alone, and now we're going to have an animal parade. So let me tell you why I think he did it that way. I did not realize when I was young that we were fairly poor growing up. In fact, my mom will tell you the story. When I was about five years old, we went to a place called the Biltmore in Asheville, North Carolina, she remembers to this day, me walking up, five-year-old, looking at that big old mansion, turning back to her, looking at it, turning back to her and saying, are we poor? <laughs> How did I realize that we were poor? Because I had something to compare it to, right? At the time, there were five of us living in a two-bedroom house in a little bitty city called Bell Buckle, Tennessee. By the way, loved it, wished we could still be there because we didn't have to lock our doors, played hide-and-go-seek through the whole city. It was awesome. I wasn't poor. It was just a different kind of richness. But here's what I think happened. Adam was alone. Did he know what, he, what alone was about? He'd never been, he'd never had somebody. So God chooses an object lesson and marches Mr. and Ms. Lion in front of him, Mr. and Ms. Bear, Mr. and Ms. Hippopotamus, Mr. and Ms. And so Adam's naming these things, and he sees everybody's got somebody except me. And after that little exercise, God says, now I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to give you a helper. Three things. He is industrious enough to work. He knows right from wrong. And he's intelligent enough to name the animals. I want you to make sure you get all three of those because here's the deal. All three of those happened before Eve was ever fashioned. Check me on it. Look in your Bible. God hadn't made Eve yet. So you know what that tells me? 
God created man with intelligence. This whole idea that we had to evolve our way up millions and millions of years, that's rubbish, guys. There's no way to harmonize the passages we just read with this idea that we evolved. In fact, let me give you the real picture. This is the picture they want our kids to see, like evolving our way up. I think we were the pinnacle of God's creation, and through sin we fell. I think it's totally the other way around. By the way, let me back up for just a minute. Somebody tell me scientifically what's wrong with going from amoeba to man. Are you getting simpler or more complex? You're getting a whole lot more complex. Second law of thermodynamics says no. Everything should be going towards a more disordered state. Evolution demands that we're going to a more complex state. So at the end of the day, the picture the Bible paints is almost the extreme opposite of what the textbooks say. Bible says man and monkey were created in the same week. And yet, good old Time Magazine wants you to believe otherwise. Time Magazine comes along and says, how man evolved. Charles Darwin, in his second book, The Descent of Man, he said, there is no fundamental difference between man and the higher mammals in their mental faculties. Well, let's just spend a minute. Share with me some some differences you know of between us and the higher mammals. I've got a couple, but I, I'd love to hear some of your thoughts. What are some differences between us and a dolphin or an ape? We can think. Speak, she said. There you go. <laughs> we speak, but I can't hear. We can speak. What else? Can't read. Reason. Okay, that's a good one. Okay, don't see a whole lot of animals reading a book. What else? Say that. Okay. Human beings can definitely think outside the box. No conscience. It's a good one. You, you don't see the lion sitting there weeping after he kills a gazelle, right? No, he's pretty much munching down. They don't live long. It's an interesting one. Ah, uh -uh, we recognize a higher being, okay? How, how many mammals, animals do you know of that can take a piece of carbon, shape it into a pencil? and either compose a song or a poem, write words to it, and then either build a musical instrument and play it, or find a wife and read her that poem. We don't find animals doing that. And yet, his idea is, eh, we're about the same. Say that again. How about the soul? Anybody think that might be a big difference? So in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. There's three words there you need to think about, us, our, and our. Those are plural, which indicates the Godhead actually got together and held kind of a conference before man was created. Didn't happen with the birds, the fish, and the creeping things. He literally spoke them into existence. With man, it was different. We're created in his image. Now, here's the question. What does it mean to be created in the image and likeness of God? I'll tell you what I've learned. I think it's extremely spot on. There's other thoughts out there. But I've been taught that God, unlike me, he doesn't have hands or face like mine, right? He's a spirit. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So if I'm created in his image, what part of me was created in his image? 
my spirit, my soul. And so unlike the animals, I got something in me that's actually going to go on even after this old physical body dies. Any other thoughts, comments? It does. You're right. Absolutely. It talks about the difference between fish, animal, and human. By the way, if you've ever, uh, uh, I don't say this lightly, I've dissected probably five to 600 human cadavers in my lifetime. You ever dissect a human, you know real quickly, that's a whole lot different than cutting into a chicken or a whole lot different than cutting into a fish. The meat of a fish is different than the meat of a chicken, isn't it? And likewise, the tissue of human beings. Again, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So what I want to do for the rest of our time tonight is I want us to talk a little bit about these alleged missing links, these fossil men that they throw at our kids over and over again. I mean, you open up a textbook and basically they put a picture in there like somebody went into the Africa jungle and took a snapshot of this guy. I teach young people, anytime you see those pictures like these, always ask this question, where's your evidence? Because if you look for just a moment, the one on the right, caption in Time Magazine says, How Apes Became Human. It's a picture of what they call Artipithecus romulus cadaba. It's the latest alleged missing link that he's, they go by Artie now, A-R-D-I. You ask the question, where's your evidence? There's all they got right there on the screen. Now, I'm going to walk back here because I want you guys to see this for just a minute. You've got some finger bones, a toe bone. These are molars or back teeth. Head of a femur. All the ones right here in the center, those are all teeth. It's part of the mandible of the jaw, some long bones of the arm. That's all they've got. Now, if you look really carefully, you'll notice there's white lines separating these into little boxes. Five different boxes. The reason there's five different boxes, those fossils were found in five different locations. In fact, take a look at what the author said. Hale Celeste and his colleagues haven't collected enough bones yet to reconstruct with great precision what Kadaba looked like. But they do know that it was about the size of a modern common chimpanzee, which when standing, averaged about four feet tall. All right, so let me get this straight. We haven't collected enough bones yet to know what this guy looks like, and yet we're going to put his picture on the cover of Time magazine, and in a two-page spread of the magazine, we're going to put replicas of it in museums so when your children go there, they can see this Artipithecus guy. We're going to put them in textbooks, but here's the best part. They got a picture of the toe bone. And underneath it, they have a caption that says, this toe bone proves the creature walked on two legs. Now, folks, I have a doctorate in anatomy and neurobiology. I, I, I've seen quite a bit of feet, right? 26 bones. They have one. One. Now, here's the best part. From that one toe bone, they're going to say that we walk uprightly and this proves it, and yet... Look at what they buried in this scientific article. Talking about the toe bone, they said not only is it separated in time by several hundred thousand years, it was also found some 10 miles away from the rest of those bones. Guess it just walked away? Guys, that's crazy. Can you imagine? You're digging out here in the yard. You find some bones. Somebody in Dixon calls you and says, hey, got a toe bone. I think it goes with your collection. You'd be like, yeah, you, you, you're crazy. By the way, that toe bone, using evolutionary methods, it dates a couple hundred thousand years later. 
but that's okay. We're going to put them together. Why would they put them together? Say that a little louder. Try to back their theory. What else? What's this whole thing really all about? Come back to money. So the guy who found it, he needed a grant from the United States government in order to do his research. I know that because I've written a couple of grants. Usually write them to either NIH, NSF. So you say, hey, could you give us 2.5, maybe $3 million over the next three years? I'm going to just be really honest with you. And if there's any scientists in here, number one, you know I'm telling the truth. Number two, you can beat me up later. First year after you get a grant, you know what you do? Nothing. Because you're glad you got the grant. Second year, you realize, okay, I got to produce some research. I got to get some results so that we can publish it. So we start looking for stuff. Third year, you're really trying to publish something because what do you want to do to that grant? You want to renew it and get it again. If I find a few bones, but I can't get that guy upright and walking, then what is he? He's just an ape. Guess what? An ape's not going to get you. It's not going to renew that grant. And so 10 miles away, they dug up a toe bone, slapped it with this collection, named it, and now they're putting it in museums. How about this guy? This guy's actually my favorite. Nebraska man. And the reason he is my favorite, this guy was actually used in the Scopes Monkey Trial as proof that evolution is true. He was put in the, uh, the Illustrated London News in 1922. So here you got a picture of him and his wife. We asked that question, where's the evidence? This time, all the evidence comes, let me back up, from a single tooth. One. Looks like four on the screen, that's actually the same tooth taken from four different vantage points. They found one tooth and they came up with this guy and his wife. Here's the best part. 40 years later, they analyzed that tooth and realized it came from an extinct pig. Not exactly a missing link. Now how about Romans chapter 1? Professing themselves to be wise, they became what? I love this. We call ourselves homo sapiens, the wise ones. And yet, we claim that we came from monkeys? Romans 1.25, they worship the creature rather than the creator. By the way, let me just take a real quick side note. Anybody think that maybe they're getting our kids to worship the creation rather than the creator? Anybody think maybe textbooks have got a lot of stuff about going green, recycling, worrying about the planet, blah, blah. Oh, yeah. Now, hear me out. I'm all for being good dominion keeper over what God has given us, okay? I think we definitely need to, in fact, I think we probably in the past didn't take care of it as good as we should have. But do I think we need to raise kids who are worshiping Mother Earth rather than Father God? No. I mean, when you stop and think about it for just a minute, I, I'll, I'll share this with you. Um, there was a, a buddy of mine by the name of Josh McDowell. I did the largest survey that has ever been done in history on pornography. He asked 16 to 60-year-old people. One of the things that he did was he got young people, those who were like 16 to 30, to rank different things that they viewed as wrong. If my memory serves me correctly, 72% viewed not recycling as very bad. 
You skip way on down the list, finally about 43% said viewing pornography is bad. So here's what that's really saying. Our kids view recycling as not recycling as a bigger sin than viewing porn. So do I, I think that maybe we got kids who are worshiping the creation rather than the creator? Yeah, I do. How about this guy, Piltdown Man? Here you see uh, an artist's depiction of what he allegedly looks like. Again, we ask the question, where's your evidence? This time we've got to go to a gravel pit, Piltdown, England. The year is 1912. They discover this. Here's what they found. They found pieces of a skull and a jawbone. For 40 years, this guy was touted as the missing link. Put in museums, put in textbook. Took 40 years to realize we'd totally been lied to. Because what they actually did was they took a fairly modern skull, broke it on purpose, the jawbone of an orangutan, they filed down the back teeth of that orangutan to make it look more human, dipped the whole thing in acid to age it, and then they buried it so they could discover it. Gave it a scientific name, and lo and behold, for 40 years people bought it. How about this guy, Orc Man? Orc Man was found in Spain. We asked the question, where's your evidence? This time it's a single piece of bone. Right back here on the back side of your head around the proud occipital region. For those of us in this room who are a little bit follically challenged, it's where your bald spot is. You'll notice the little green outline right there. Take a look at the cast they made below it, though. If you look carefully at that, you'll notice the brain cavity is pretty small. And they couldn't figure out how in the world do you go from having that small a brain because the bone didn't curve like our bone. They couldn't figure out how do you make it go to this. Well, in the 1980s, they decided maybe it's a child. Maybe that's why the brain case is so small. 1982, they announced they got the oldest humanoid fossil ever discovered in Europe. The only problem is they later discovered that one piece of bone came from a six-month-old donkey. Not exactly the best missing link. How about this one? Lucy. I remember sitting in a biology class, Professor Davenport was my professor's name, and he flat out told us, this is the link between humans and apes. Australopithecus afarensis is its real scientific name. This guy right here, Donald Johansson, was the one that found her. Part of her name comes from where she was discovered, the Afar region of Africa. So... Australopithecus afarensis. Anybody know how she got her nickname? The night they made the discovery, they were celebrating in the camp. Now, this is back in the old days when they had vinyls, which is kind of weird because vinyls are coming back, so it's all messed up. But they had vinyl records playing. One record kept being played over and over and over again as they were celebrating that night. That record was Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. And the name stuck. Now, this guy got super wealthy and super famous from this discovery. But he made the discovery more than 30 years ago. And since then, we've actually had time to look at the fossils, do some comparisons. Uh, part of what we do in anatomy is we do comparative anatomy. So I'm not going to go through all these different points on the screen, but I am going to go through a couple of them. Like the second point on the screen talks about having locking wrist. You and I, we don't have locking wrist. Animals that walk on all fours, 
They do. They're quadrupeds. Guess what Lucy's got? She's got locking wrists. Maggie Fox said, a chance discovery made by looking at the cast of the bones of Lucy, the most famous fossil of Australopithecus afarensis, shows her wrist is stiff like a chimpanzee's. This suggests her ancestors walked on their knuckles. Or how about the fourth point on the screen? Talking about a rib cage. Now, everybody in this room that is human You've got a barrel-shaped rib cage. Kind of, if you picture in your mind, uh, I was going to say Jack Daniels, but I'm probably not supposed to say that in here, so just a barrel, okay? You guys know what I'm talking about. Kind of starts out, and then it gets wider. And it, some of us got bigger barrels than others, but we all got barrel-shaped rib cage. Apes have conical-shaped rib cages. Kind of comes down like a cone. When Lucy was first presented on the scene, they say she's got a barrel-shaped ribcage. She's on her way to becoming a human. And then they began to send replicas to museums all over the planet. Take a look at what Peter Schmidt said when they got their replica of Lucy. He said, when I started to put the skeleton together, I expected it to look human. Everyone talked about Lucy being very modern, very human. So I was surprised by what I saw. I noticed the ribs were more round in cross-section. More like what you see in apes. Human ribs are flatter in cross section. But the biggest, but the shape of the rib cage itself was the biggest surprise of all. The human rib cage is barrel shaped. And I just couldn't get Lucy's ribs to fit this kind of shape. But I could get them to make a conical shaped rib cage, like what you see in apes. You see, when you really start to evaluate the evidence, what you realize? Lucy is nothing more than an adult male pygmy chimp. You say male? Yeah, look at the last point on the screen. Her pelvis? <laughs> they have done everything humanly possible from computer-aided drafting, measurements of all kind, MRIs, trying to figure out how in the world could we squeeze a child through her pelvis? <laughs> and they realize... We can't, because she's a he. Now, this is long before we had trouble figuring out what a woman was and transgender this and that. Lucy didn't take hormones. This is just an adult male pygmy chimp. Here's the interesting part of it. This is what Donald Johansson found as far as what's put in most textbooks. On the screen up here, there are eight different pictures that have all been published as being authenticated representations of Lucy. So take a look. See any differences? Like jaw? Or how about this? How many ribs does she have? Because some of them, some of them got five, some of them got seven. Kind of makes you wonder like, What's going on? One of the inter most interesting things, we went to the uh, St. Louis Museum several years ago. They had a big Darwin shrine, and they had a life-size replica of what they thought Lucy looked like. This is the lower portion of it. And the reason I'm showing you that, how much of Lucy's lower leg did they find? Like, let me back up. Right here is the knee joint. So how much do they know about her ankle, her foot? Or how about this? How much hair, according to those fossils, did this creature have on his body? Those fossils don't tell you things like that, do they? So we pointed out, we're like, hey, you know this exhibit you got? This really isn't for education. What you're really doing is you're indoctrinating, which there is a difference, by the way. Museum officials did not like that. In fact, let me back up. Bruce Carr, the director of the zoo, look at what he, he said. Zoo officials have no plans to knuckle under. 
We cannot be updating every exhibit based on every new piece of evidence. We look at the overall exhibit and the impression it creates. We think the overall impression this creates is correct. In other words, it sells the image we want it to sell. Let's look at one more before I let you guys go sugar up. How many of you have heard about Neanderthal? Now, let me just point out to the wives in this room, just because your husband lives like a Neanderthal does not mean evolution is true, okay? This guy is National Geographic's favorite cover guy. I mean, they, about every six, eight months, they got to put a new picture of him out there. It, it's, it's their go-to. By the way, just a real quick aside, anybody think that it matters if our kids are looking at this stuff? Less than two years ago, I was talking to an elder in the Church of Christ who had walked away from the church. And I was calling to try to bring him back and to get him back and to see where, what, went, what went wrong. Been faithful for more than 50 years. And in our conversation, I remember distinctly him saying this. You know, Brad, when, my, when I was little, my parents subscribed to two magazines. He named them Life and National Geographic. And he said every month I would go into our basement, I would take that magazine, read it cover to cover, and he said those pictures stuck with me. And he went on to say, surely <clears throat> all of those pictures can't be wrong. Now guys, that's an elder in the church. What do we know about this guy? The foreground, you see a picture of what they're calling a Neanderthal skull. In the background, you see what we would call a human skull. Not a whole lot of difference. In fact, if you were to ask anatomically what's the difference, basically you got this brow ridge right here. Now there is coloration difference, but that's, they would say that's from the fossilization process. So basically, you got this really heavy brow ridge. So here's what they say. This is our closest ancestor. Apparently, we went from walking on all fours like the apes to eventually an upright stance. And in the textbooks, they put this guy, like if this were Homo sapiens, they would put him right behind us. Here's the problem with that. In 1952... A guy by the name of Dr. A.J. Cave, if I can get my clicker working, 1958, excuse me, Dr. A.J. Cave examined the original Neander Valley fossils, and he proved that it was nothing more than a guy who had suffered from advanced stages of arthritis. Let me ask you guys, does arthritis change bone structure? In this room right now, do you think there's anybody that might have some bone disorders like osteoporosis, arthritis? If my mom were sitting here tonight, I could say rheumatoid arthritis because she's got that. Does that change bone structure? Yeah. Now, here's the really crazy thing I want you to think about. So you've got disease that can change bone structure. The fossilization process by itself can also change because when you got that much pressure of dirt, water, all the stuff compacted on it, that can change it. But what about size variation? Like in this room as I'm looking at you, I'm looking at young people, old people, normal size heads, little heads, fat heads. You realize in this room there might be one or two of you that would qualify as Neanderthals? I'll point you out later on, okay? A buddy of mine by the name of Jack Cuzo, he examined the Neanderthals a lot more than I did. Here's what he said in his book, Buried Alive. He said, you must understand the skull really cries out disease. The teeth are badly decayed. The bones of the vault of the skull are extremely thick. There are many features that testify of acromelia or the excessive secretion of growth hormone in adulthood. 
What are you saying, Jack? Is this a missing link? No, it's a diseased human. This was uh, a couple of years ago, or last year actually, where they're again, they're suggesting, hey, found the oldest. Look at the wording they use. The oldest human fossils found outside of Africa suggest our species may have left the continent 200,000 years ago. Catch those words, suggest, may have, coulda, shoulda, woulda. What does the fossil record really show? I'm going to let a guy named Jeremy Rifkin tell you because I think he summed it up beautifully. He said, what the fossil record shows is nearly a century of fudging and finagling by scientists attempting to force various fossil morsels and fragments to conform with Darwin's notions all to no avail. Today, the millions of fossils stand as very visible, ever-present reminders of the paltriness of the arguments and the overall shabbiness of the theory that marches under the banner of evolution. He's right. Guys, our kids need to understand they were created in the image and likeness of God. I promise you their behavior will be different. Their outlook will be different. You want to know why we got so much depression and suicide among young people? Take away a God. Take away their hope. We got to go back and we got to teach them there is hope. There is a God. You were created in his image. And oh, by the way, he loved you so much. What did he do? He was willing to go to the cross. It is my hope and my prayer that this week, I, I know a lot of this was review. I know for some of you, you were like glazed over because this is a science class and you don't want science. But it's my hope and prayer that I gave you a little bit of evidence that you can share with your friends, your neighbors, your children, your grandchildren. Because today more than ever we need it. I'm going to close this out in prayer, and then I'm going to let you guys go down and enjoy some good ice cream. Let's, let's close in prayer. Glorious Heavenly Father, we bow before you, acknowledging you as our creator and our sustainer, thanking you for life and for breath, thanking you ultimately for giving us a soul, creating us in your image, loving us enough to send your son. Heavenly Father, we ask a special prayer tonight on each and every one of the young people in this congregation. We ask that you protect them from Satan. Help them to grow up to be strong warriors. Help us to give them the, the tools they need for the fight that they're going to be in. Because Heavenly Father, ultimately we want to see every set of eyes in heaven help us to be diligent help us to persevere give the parents the grandparents in this room a double dose of courage and Heavenly Father help us to remember that ultimately this is a battle between light and darkness again we thank you so much for this time that we've had to come together to study to learn, to laugh. Thank you for fellowship and ultimately thank you for our Christian family. Heavenly Father, as we go our separate ways, I would ask that you keep us all safe. Be with those who are struggling, whether it be physical, mental, emotional. Help us to be a Christian family that reaches out as your hands and your feet. And ultimately, Heavenly Father, let us look out into the world and take the good news to the lost. Again, we thank you so much for Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.